Yeah, this talk is about Varlink. Varlink is this thing that we have uh, started adopting in Systemd recently, and people might be wondering why. And I think we deserve, a, a, like, the, the community deserves a good answer to that question. I kind of hope that I can give that answer with this talk. So what's uh, Varlink? Um, has been around for a while, found some initial adoption, and then didn't find any adoption anymore. But now with Systemd, uh, we kind of are, like, uh, finally adopting it full time, and ho I hope that uh, we're not going to be the only project there. It's a uh, extremely simple IPC. It's ultimately I can explain this to you in uh, basically one slide. It's uh, some JSON formatted um, uh, formatted request over a SOC stream socket um, terminated by a null byte, and then it gets a reply back, also JSON terminated by a null byte. And that's really uh, uh, all there is to it. And now I wanted to close my laptop and just walk away because now you know everything. But uh, I don't dare because, I don't know, maybe the projector doesn't recover from that. But uh, yeah, of course, there is more to it. So um, there, is, uh, there are specs um, on Vardak.org about this. There are bindings available for all kinds of languages. Um, and uh, yeah, it has been around for quite a while, but initially with little adoption. What the fuck? Um, uh, yeah, um, right now, um, everything on Linux, I guess, um, that does low-level system stuff kind of has uh, uh, relied on Dbus. Well, I mean, there's some areas where it's not used, but it's kind of universal for bigger system. Um, it's okay for many users, um, but it has uh, some serious limitations for others, and uh, these limitations uh, became visible already, like in the beginning when we started doing Systemd. And we found some solutions. Um, uh, so Systemd deeply integrates with Dbus, uh, and that's not going to change anytime soon, but it's always like, uh, it's pain in some areas. Um, so let's talk about Dbus, uh, about the specific problems that I see there. So one of the big ones for Systemd, uh, the, the biggest one, I guess, is it's only available in late boot, right? Like there's the Dbus daemon or Dbus broker or whatever Dbus uh, uh, implementation you're using. And that's a service that is started during late boot. That basically means during early boot, we want to do IPC2, but we can't really um, because, yeah, the, 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 the bus is simply not up. Um, Extending Dbus to early boot is not trivial, right? Like because in an early boot, um, much more than during late boot, it's always that various resources are not available just yet because the OS is still initializing, and that basically means you need some kind of scheduling, right? Like you need scheduling when you can make activation, uh, uh, can you can allow activation. Something like this does not exist in Dbus. Like there have been proposals of maybe doing something about this, but uh, it feels to me that Dbus kind of stuck there, and. Uh, uh, yeah, um, because of the other problems that I'm going to talk about, I think it's not realistic to, to fix this problem. So, it's too late for many, probably even more than half of the things that system does, right? Like, because, I don't know, I mentioned this in the, in, the, in the session just before this one, that Network D, I think one of the limiting things was that we don't have a Dbus API because Dbus comes so late. Um, uh, but it's all, everything else too, Systemd itself, Resolve D, all these things um, uh, must be available during earliest boot already, and that makes Dbus a really problematic choice. Systemd's way out so far was um, that we tried to be our own little Dbus daemon, right, like PID1 is its own Dbus daemon, has this private socket where it speaks the Dbus protocol, and this is what other people do too, and I fucking hate it. Um, because it's like, uh, I mean, it's, it's like Dbus, but not using Dbus, because it uses the Dbus serialization, but doesn't do um, all the concepts that Dbus traditionally does, which is, uh, I don't know, signal matching and things like this. Because there is no broker on the other side, but just some, you're talking directly to P81, all these things don't, don't uh, make any sense. So in, in, in SDBus, for example, the library that we use, there's all these special cases. Are we talking of a direct connection? Then we do not need to install a match handle. If it is a real uh, broker, then we have to do this. So I don't know, it always feels wrong, right? Like you take Dbus and then you rip out, um, I don't know, probably 80% of the concepts and you, 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 uh, something remains and you try to make it work, but also, I don't know. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a, the serialization is used, subsets of the header fields, um, but otherwise quite uh, different, no matches, no name protocol, no peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication and things like this. Um, one other major issue that always was painful for us is it cannot use for many basic IPC servers. The ones that Dbus daemon or Dbus broker um, themselves want to talk to. These are, for example, user resolution services, right? Like we have userdbd, for example, on systemd, and, and like quite a few sources nowadays where users uh, user 
uh, where user definitions come from. And uh, uh, when divas initializes, wants to resolve all users basically that are listed in the policy. Um, and for that, it wants do does um, glibc nss and that again uh, then needs to do ipc and uh, in the initial versions the system to be implemented that via dbus because this problem wasn't that clear to us yet and then we realized oh my god this creates a cyclic loop right like dbus uses nss which uses dbus and there you have your deadlock so um, it's a mess, right? Um, uh, this is not just for, for user resolution, it's also for, for logging, right? Like talking to syslog. There's a reason why, uh, uh, why everybody uses direct communication for, for syslog, but this then propagates, right? Like that also means that um, our logging team in general D can never do debus, right? Like because it would be debus that synchronously logs to journal D, and if journal D um, uh, itself talks to debus um, to register its name and things like this, then you have again your cyclic. Um, um, uh, uh, dependency, and yeah, we ran into these issues um, uh, in other contexts. But it's it's like yeah, it's simply that Dbus is already too too late, um, and IPC is something that should be really really basic. I'm I'm sure that always works. Um, a couple of other problems, like one of them is you cannot use it to stream data, right? Um, it's it's not supposed to be that, right? Like it's supposed to be so this control protocol um, where you just send short messages that say start this, stop this, and things like this. But the, the world ultimately is not like that. Sometimes you need to enumerate stuff, and that is already pretty messy with um, with DBAS because you cannot stream actual data with it. So that basically means you have to um, make sure that you don't stream too much because if you stream too much, then DBAS will kick you off the bus because you keep flooding it with messages, right? So so um, this pushes people towards a certain way of d designing their APIs, right? Like, um, for example, in systemd, this means basically there's one call list units, and that only sh uh, returns like basically short, like a really short summary and a, and a handle to the unit. And then you have to individually ask all, uh, the information about the, all the units um, uh, to get the full data. This is inefficient because it involves round trips and things like this, and it's just messy because it's also not atomic and these kind of things, right? Like you, you never are able to get over debug an atomic idea of what's actually going on in systemd because, yeah, we can't do it. And Dbus, by design, if we would try it, would kick us off the bus. People ran into this all the time. Like in systemd, for example, this is something easily triggerable. triggerable. Uh, uh, if you do the system control dump thing, like it's, it's like a debug command that basically gives you a text description, like human readable text description, what's currently going on in PID1. Um, this thing can get large on large installations, and was like initially we just sent that as a Dbus string uh, over, and uh, Dbus uh, kicked uh, system off the bus. So um, uh, uh, we then added the side channel, it was MAMFD, and what else, and that's what people tend to do, right? Like they figure out, okay, we can't use Dbus for these things, um, so we have to have that side channel if it's actually uh, a proper data there. And it's messy because, you know, the stuff that I was just talking about, that is actually in my um, philosophical uh, um, looking at the problem, that's control, that's not data, that's control, it should work. Verlang doesn't have that problem. You can scale as much stuff, uh, um, through, like push as much stuff uh, through there as you want. And, and that basically means like, yeah, if you want to have a dump of all the units with all the state, it will give you this and it will do this in a reasonably um, atomic fashion. So that's a, that's a, that's a massive improvement, I think. Um, uh, yeah, so it's also slow, you know, because in DBus it's like this thing where you have the broker and every message from any process to any other process always goes through the broker. And this is like, this basically means that every, every uh, round trip, first of all, requires four context switches. And context switches, like a, meaning from the, from the sender to the broker, from the broker to the recipient, from the recipient to the broker and from the broker back to the client. Um, these, these round trips are awful enough, but if we have to do for every round trip actually four context switches, this is really bad. Because, you know, people misunderstand like what actually makes a system slow. It's the round trips that kill everything. It's not like, I don't know, time you waste on, on additional marshalling for JSON, which is another slide I have later. So, yeah, it is, a, it is a problem. It's unnecessarily slow, and particularly if you actually want to exchange a lot of data. Um, yeah, there's another problem, I think. The security model is kind of garbage. Like, it has this XML um, uh, uh, language where you're supposed to individually control in a static fashion access to individual methods. In reality, nobody's really using that anymore. Like, everybody just has really, um, like, they, they just basically control 
shall it be public or not per method, and that's kind of it. And then there's a little bit of more useful access control, like who's allowed to own a dbus name and things like this. But like it has this intricate language that is not useful, in particular because on the desktop, for example, um, you tend to want to have some co uh, interactive component in there, like policy kit, and that's what everybody uh, ends up using. And even on us, on the enterprise-y, um, like Azure-y uh, things, we actually use Polkit th there because we need more complex policies. So um, yeah, security model, I think, is useless to the point that I think it shouldn't probably exist at all. Um, and uh, they all use policy kit anywhere. This makes, of course, everything even worse because it basically means you then have to talk to Polkit, which Probably is fine, by the way, but it also means that you now have for every system level um, interaction, you already have six more pro process context switches because suddenly it's the individual backends that need to talk to policy kit, which is again like goes via the broker and then the reply back to the broker. So summary, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, performance is not great. Um, and a couple of other things, like I mean, can I, I can go on shitting all over Dbus. Um, I like to know, I, I like to think that I know Dbus quite well. I worked with a long time. I have many commits in Dbus Daemon. I have implemented the client library as, as Dbus. Um, Dbus at this time, I think it's was either were 17 years old or something. Um, I think right now, I don't know. I, I know why it's why, why what what the problems are. Um, yeah, one one thing for example that I really don't like is the fact is that. You know, they're, they're typically when you do IPC, you have this pattern where you go to some service and allocate an object there, and then you subscribe to changes from that object. In Dbus, it's inherently racy to do this, right? Like because if you do this, you first do your Dbus call to the other side, the object is created, but now you need to to, to subscribe to the signals about it, right? Like so that you actually get the notification. So what do you do? You go, then go to the uh, um, uh, broker and ask for the signal subscription. But this creates a window where you, the object existed, but the signals um, uh, 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 are not delivered to to you yet because the match is not installed yet. And this is messy because it basically means you have to create the object, you install the signal, and then you have to ask again, did anything change uh, in the meantime while I wasn't watching? And that's just bad because it's such a common pattern. Um, uh, then there's a stuttering thing, you know, like, you know, we had these, these attempts to add KDBS to the kernel and things like this. What people who are not at home in Dbus always complain about is this what some people call stuttering, and I think that kind of makes sense. It's like if you look at a Dbus call um, in code or from the command line, you always see that it kind of repeats the same strings in the command line. Like it's you'd call um, org .system, uh, org .free desktop systemd and then you call the object slash org <laughs> free desktop systemd and then you call the interface org free desktop systemd. So you basically wrote the same string um, at least three times. Um, into the same command line, and people under, like feel that's kind of stuttering, right? Like it's repeating the same string. They are different concepts, absolutely, but uh, this is hard for people to understand. It make it creates a, a learning cur curve and an unnecessary one, as I think. And there's so much more. Like uh, I'm not gonna like we don't have that much time, so I'm not gonna go into all of this. Um, but it's like yeah, look at the slides later. There's so many many problems with this. Um, I already explained what Varlink is. Varlink also has problems. Like everything has problems. Like uh, first of all, it's using JSON. JSON for system level stuff comes with this problem that JSON is traditionally not 64-bit clean, right? It inherits like it, it comes from JavaScript, and JavaScript everything is a float, and that basically means they don't have a native integer support, and that basically means that most of the implementations of JSON uh, kind of agreed that you should not use. Um, uh, 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 rely on 64 integers to be available and instead limit yourself to 52 bit because that's what like is the mantis of 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 32 bit uh, of 64 bit uh, floating point numbers um so it's only uh, like an accurate um mapping from integers to float if you limit yourself to 52 bit um this is the well-known problem. There have been RFCs that deal with that problem, like, um, and that basically tell everybody just use 52-bit, and the problem is, is okay. I think it is a problem for low-level stuff, but I don't think it's a big problem actually, because, like, at least in systemd, you know, because uh, uh, Dbus doesn't have a nullable concept, right? Like fields cannot be left empty or something like this. Um, people ended up using, um, like. Let's say they have a have a 64-bit integer, then then used either zero or uint 46 max as the special value that is supposed to to indicate the niche value null. Uh, in systemd, we do that all the time, by the way. Um, but uh, the thing is, in in JSON, you actually do have a proper null type, so you you. <laughs> 
you do not have to uh, uh, actually rely on this, right? Like you can just use a proper null, then you don't need the special meaning of u in 64 max um, to indicate this. And as it turns out, most of the resources that we manage on, sy uh, on systems that actually are large are not quite large as 64-bit integers. So I think it's not a big problem that people think it is. Also, in the uh, system implementation of Varling, we, and this is what many people do, um, we, we're just fine with when it's, well, an application asks for a 64-bit integer, we are fine to either parse it as a 64-bit integer, um, but also as a string, like people can encode this in string, which is what many people in the industry do, and hence I don't think it's a problem. Also, JSON is, of course, the marshalling is a little bit bigger and a little bit slower to generate, right, like than the, than the compact stuff that Dbus marshalling does. Um, uh, um, I don't know, like Zishan, if he's here, he did some analysis about this because he doesn't believe me that this actually matters. Uh, uh, like I said, it doesn't. He did, uh, said it does. Um, so it's like 30% slower or something for large objects, right? Like you have to have them really large to actually hit, it, hit this. I don't think, yeah, I mean, given that Dbus isn't really useful for large objects, I'm not that concerned. But uh, if you are concerned about this, you need to focus, like, figure out what your priorities are, because you know the thing that makes Steva slow is not the marshalling or something like this, or or that makes Varling slow is not the marshalling. It's always about the round trips. The round trips kill you. It's not the slightly wasteful uh, uh, marshalling uh, that JSON is, and it's so useful that it's JSON because for the first time, if I uh, um, s trace a, a systemy system, I can actually make sense of the IPC calls being done, and this alone is like um, one of the killer features of, of Varling, that you actually fucking understand your own system nowadays. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't have that much time because the time slot is so, so short. Uh, and we want to do questions. I want to do one more thing. I don't know if I find the right slide very quickly. Oh, that's it's right here. One of the massive uh, um, if, if benefits of Varling that I still want to use my time for to, to emphasizing is you know, in, in SystemD, we wanted to add a Dbus service, this Dbus API, for many of our components. Like, for example, boot control, like this little tool that allows you to install a bootloader. It's a tool that is inherently necessary to get your system running, but it's also a tool that you will almost never call except when you install your system, right? So uh, um, there was always this plan, and wasn't it to do file to add a Dbus service? And it was would be it would have been painful because Dbus pushes you into this model that you have a multiplex connection, right? Like you have one connection to the broker, and that's where you receive all your message calls from, and you're supposed to. Par uh, um, process them all in parallel. But this means that your programs need to be actually asynchronous in that regard, right? And it must be able to, to process multiple requests at the same time. In Varlink, this problem is solved. You know, we have all these little tools like boot control, which are kind of synchronous, right? Like they, you give them a command, they execute the command, they exit, done, right? Now with Varlink, we can do this really nice thing. You know, these tools tend to, like we had this in the, in the, in the prior talk, like they nowadays tend to give us output already JSON, right? So what Varlink kind of does is it adds one more thing that you can also to, to uh, uh, give the command, like as input for, the, for these tools, encode things in JSON, so that you basically say, SCD in, you get a little bit of JSON. SCD out, you generate a little bit of uh, JSON. And then you use uh, system to use, um, socket activation to bind it to a socket. And suddenly, you have actually really good IPC API for a completely synchronous tool, right? Like, because you use socket activation with the mode where accept equals yes, which basically means the system can uh, automatically uh, um, fork off multiple instances of multiple requests come in. So, and I think this is an absolute killer feature, right? Like, because it suddenly makes it feasible and easy for all these little synchronous tools that we have, like, for example, in Utah Linux, like, uh, half a ton of them, like LOC setup, FDisk, and these kind of things, and the system is the same thing. Like, all these little synchronous tools could very easily, trivially, without changing the whole structure from a simple, static, isolated thing into this massive monster of, of uh, dynamic, parallel, asynchronous uh, behavior into IPC service. And I think everybody would benefit from this. So to me personally, it took me a while to realize how awesome this is. But um, in systemd, uh, like, uh, uh, once I realized this, I added like to PCR lock to, to a couple of other things, um, uh, Varling services suddenly, because it was so easy, right? Like didn't have to restructure the programs to be asynchronous and, and have an event loop and blah, blah, blah. I could just re read my method call from standard input and re give my reply on standard output. So anyway, uh, maybe we have one minute or something. We for have five minutes for a question. Oh, we actually do have five minutes. So uh, 
Okay, first, before question, let me just say, I mean, DBOS has many problems, like every technology, but we greatly appreciate the work that, you know, David and Simon do, a DBOS Boker maintainer, DBOS Demo maintainer, and we are very appreciative of their work. How are the interfaces defined? What's the type safety story when they use JSON? Sorry? At DBUS, we have pretty, um, you can define the data types of your fields, right? What is the type safety story? So uh, there's, there's an IDL language in, in Varlink where you basically can say, um, it, it's a lot richer than uh, what DBUS ever had because it knows structures and enums, which is kind of the thing that we use all the time in, in, uh, in, in systemd for over the bus, but we don't have those types, so it's kind of always a little bit like there's there's a lot of type info inf uh, involved, but it's not useful to the to the reader because we never you can't even recognize uh, enums and, and instructs in this. Um, but it's way better, right? Like in um, the IDL language, do I have a nice example? Um, I could probably show you later on the uh, uh, on my laptop like how this looks like. But it's very readable, right? Like because you know the the problem with IDL in Debas in particular. Um, uh, and and in this, this type safety is that it's like it's not clear why the IDL exists. Like, um, what's what's the audience of the IDL uh, in Divas? Is it for for language binding so that they can add some type safety automatically, or is the audience users like humans uh, to read it and understand this? Um, in, uh, in in Varlink, we try to figure like say our model is clearly that it's supposed to be human readable, right? Like it's supposed to look nice, um, so it's not fucking XML or something like this. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, um, I hope that's, that's, yeah, it's better. It's just a good short summary. Other questions? Behind you. Oh, it's behind you. <laughs> so, do you think, uh, well, I haven't really heard of Varlink before this. Do you think Varlink is like a, replacement for DBus entirely? Like, do you think all of you space should be using Varlink, or do you think DBus still has like a place to exist? It's a good question. Um, I have a slide about this. Um, it's, again, like, because the slot is so short, we didn't come to, but, uh, shit. Um. A anyway, so the, I think the summary at this point is, like, semantically, I think Varlink has, like, is as good as it could possibly get, and I'm not aware of any like besides the one the 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 the, the 64 bit integer thing on on Varling, I don't see any like any point where Varling would be worse than Dbus. I have one. Um, what Dbus has has uh, f going forward is though it's universally adopted, right? Like I don't know, Flatpak has a proxy for this and th things like this. Um, so uh, um, that is valid. That is valid something, right? Um, that you have uh, language support in almost everything. So, but I personally think, uh, you know, in my system D point of view, I think uh, we'll probably uh, we continue going to support Dbus and going to continue extending that. But for new stuff, I kind of see that we're probably going to do more valing stuff. So in future, there's going to be both. But I personally, um, from my low-level system point of view, I think Varling is the way to go. Um, so there is one thing that Dbus does better, which is discoverability. So I can do bus CTL and I see everything that's available there. For Varling, it's random sockets where yeah I mean I have some ideas about that problem um, but uh, yeah I think the, the Linux kernel kind of gives you help uh, with this because you can do cat proc net unix right and then if it's a if it's a reverse domain implementation thing and one thing I want from the kernel is that we can attach extended attributes on these um, af unix uh, inodes and then we could actually implement in, in, in varling control a really nice list of all the sockets uh, that are that are varling sockets basically and you can connect to this and it's not maintained by us it's maintained by the kernel and that's, that's so much more lovely <laughs> Why? <laughs> so, so I've got a question about using um, the Varlink mechanism to turn a basic synchronous uh, program into a socket, socket activatable one. Um, does systemd guarantee some kind of back pressure? Otherwise, you could just keep spamming and essentially. Uh, um, well, I mean, the connections are like because it's brokerless, right? Like there's always direct connections. Um, uh, uh, it's a job for your event loop to uh, schedule this. Right. It means the socket. Can you yeah. So because can I, can I basically pressure system D into accepting more and more sockets until eventually it runs out because my program isn't responding or something like that? 
it means templated units. So this is template, no, the, so you can start oh, 10 uh, million, but to we have rate limits, right? If I added to templated units, um, uh, like we always had this thing in there for, for IP connections that we uh, um, maintain how many connections came in per, per uh, IP address, and I extended this so that on AF Unix sockets we now keep track of how many com connections came in per user. So um, yes, you can probably, um, if you send too many uh, things in parallel, uh, 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 to a soft DOS from which we will hopefully eventually recover once you stop doing this. Um, but you cannot trigger this from a single user um, because, yeah, we have the per user uh, concurrent limit um, on things. So I, I think it's kind of the same as DBS. Do you have uh, an idea to implement uh, in, uh, service introspection in Varling? Uh, that's like next level to what uh, Luca said, uh, that you have the to you can list services, but you can also see what uh, what they implement. Yes, I know. So. Uh, um like there is introspection for, for, for interfaces, but because there's no object tree or anything like this, because uh, you know it's one of these other things that I think are really weird in Dbus is that it forces on you these these Dbus object path, which are like an a synth synthetic um, uh, identifier, which kind of means always that in Dbus um, uh, everybody needs has their own identifiers, and then that needs to turn them in, into Dbus object path, uh, and then always back, and you always have to have an explicit method call to supply this, which also are, again means additional round trips and things like that. Varling doesn't do this, right? Like Varling assumes that you use your own identifiers, the native ones that you have, but this also implies that there is no enumeration of objects because there are no objects; they're just method calls. So we do have introspection for everything. Um, but because there is no object concept, you cannot enumerate objects. You can uh, 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 enumerate interfaces. Um, is there some auth um, included or authentication authorization so that the process knows if it's root or some guest user asking? Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 in Dbus, the authentication is kind of weird because it has like, it's, it's actually two protocols. Like, there's the authentication protocol, and then we switch to the actual Dbus protocol. And it's always weird because on Linux, we don't need this, right? On Linux, the authentication happens by IF Unix. And that is the answer here, too. Uh, in Varlink, does not define authentication protocol because the assumption is that if you do authentication, you do it out of, pro uh, out of uh, uh, protocol um, uh, via the, the, the side channel. Um, that you have, which is um, uh, and we use it with barley, credentials, with it, right? We um, it and we, we hooked it up to Polkit, so you can can even use it like this. Um, and if you want to use it over HTTP or something like this, which is very natural because this is response request space, it's very natural uh, to 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 port it on top of HTTP. Um, then this would be the job for your HTTP implementation to deal with. But Varlink will not help you in this. It assumes that the layers below deal with that. Problem. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lena. You're out of time.